the song that you hear is an angry one. And I am sure if you are seeing things clear, you'll see that all happiness is gone. And then the dogs, the dogs are barking too long. It's a sign, a sign that something is wrong. So hark, hark, the dogs do bark. The beggars are coming to town. Beggars in rags, beggars in tags, beggars in their velvet gown. Everybody who is 40 years old, they know nothing about this business. And I think that we have a responsibility to go there. I think we have a responsibility to look at ourselves, laugh, cry, see how stupid we were, how wise we were, how sensible we were, how good or bad, whatever it is. Um, we need to get into that conversation. 1970 has its antecedents into the dashed hopes that people had for what independence would mean, a better quality of life, better opportunities um, for employment and so on, and better work environment, higher wages. And um, that didn't seem to be happening for a lot of people. One of the issues that Black Power raised very early was the ownership of the commanding heights of the economy, as it was called at the time, by white people. Very few black people had any, any hands in business, any ownership in business in Trinidad. It was largely either local whites or foreign whites. Unity, that is so unique. It's fantastic, yes, so to speak. And this is one of their, their, their big arguments. That in fact, you know, the only jobs, that, that the only business where people were, black people were involved in business was the store clerks. You know, at junior levels in, in businesses generally. No senior positions at all. Yeah, the Negroes, the white man, the Chinese, the Indian, we walk together in hand. I mean, eight years after independence. We had independence in 1962. You look at that, at that country where um, every queen and race is supposed to find an equal place. And when you catch yourself, you find in terms of employment, you look at the banks, you look at the, the airlines and, and places like these, and you can't see a black face. Except if the black face, the, the black person will be carrying the, 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 the tea tray or pushing the broom and the shovel. I would recall in my case, I was in high school with this white guy. Obviously, I can't call his name. He was in second form. He wasn't particularly bright. He was close to the bottom of the class. And his parents took him out of school. And he got a job in a big company downtown and he before I knew what was happening he was driving motor car wearing white shirt and tie and the fellow could hardly count and that was the extent to which employment practices were skewed and driven by race and color the Negroes felt that they had done much better in school, and there were white boys who had good positions in firms, okay, and had better jobs than them, okay. Well, that's a part of life, okay. It's not only what you know, it's who you know, okay. And no doubt that um, I myself was not a very good scholar. I liked everything about school except the books. <laughs> and. Um, I joined Barclays Bank because I had a, uh, my mother had a friend who knew uh, the bank manager, Mr. George, very well. And he contacted him and, and, and rang him and I got a job. The banks also, they did employ locals, but they wanted locals of a certain hue. There was a black man working as a clerk at Barclays Bank at Independence Square in the Salvatore building. And he was a spectacle. People used to go into the bank just to look at this guy because that was unseen. 
And if you walked across the road to Royal, it was as if you were in Canada. But I remember talking to a senior manager at a major bank in Trinidad at the time, and he said to me, but if you hire black people in banks, people's business will be all over the streets, which is his rationale for it, you know. It was easy to identify um, with the need for, for some, some vibration, something to bring about the change in the way in which we were living. You see, one of the problems, and I do not blame Eric Williams for that, is that we didn't fight for independence. In fact, we were begged to take it. And um, I think it could have been the worst thing to happen to a colonial society. They went to England. The Queen was very, very happy to sign whatever document she had to sign. And they returned with independence. I don't think they even had serious meetings in the country on independence. So the people here were not involved in the acquisition of independence. They didn't understand that they were going into a new phase, except if Williams gave a lecture. But remember, they had no spiritual involvement in the entire exercise. There was no motivation for them to realize this has to be a new society. We are now responsible for our lives and for the development of this country. The position of Eric Williams in the context of 1970 is a very interesting one. Because in a real sense, a lot of what the black poor people were saying, and uh, were saying at, at any rate, uh, they had learnt from Williams. So he must have been torn, and in, in a sense, uh, here was he, an important uh, leader, an important intellectual, somebody who had always envisaged himself, uh, saw himself as the leading intellectual of the Caribbean Revolution, Caribbean nationalism, West Indian, you know, all of these things he talked about. And now these things were being thrown in his face, so to speak, by the successor generation, saying, yes, you, 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 you said all these things, but look, you, you haven't delivered. Among Africans, certainly, he was almost a godlike figure at one time. Now, this started to decline in the latter part of the, of the 1960s. But, you know, there was still a very strong, he was still a very powerful figure. When the, the black power movement started to develop and, start, and he started to come like a contradiction now, people are saying, how come you can have institutions that discriminate against black-skinned people in the society, whether they're African, whether they're Indian? The darker your skin is, the more discrimination you would suffer in the society after eight years of of independence. Williams, in, in his own way, represented black power. He was the first black prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Granger and they began to address the issue very, very quickly because it began to be raised, you know, but, but, but do you have a black government? Why are you attacking a black government, you know? And they were accusing the Williams government of, in fact, being a white government at heart and in mind. And the black skin was just a cover. Eric Williams is uh, Massa de Dunn was one of the worst things he ever said. Because that, in the mind of the public, was white man they done. Okay. And they thought that the time had come for them to take over everything, which was an impossibility and unpractical. In the period, um, there was a whole different international scenario uh, arising from what was taking place in Vietnam. The South Africa question, Nelson Mandela at the time, uh, Fidel Castro, Ho Chi Minh, a whole number of things, and we were not outside of that influence at the time. People like Che Guevara and Castro become 
our heroes. We began getting posters of Che and Catherine have them in our in jerseys and on the walls and and Angela Davis with the Afro. Every young black person or anyone who was touched by the changes wanted an Afro. And then they get black in America, so obviously as fellow Americans we get black too. So by sixty by sixty eight we were fairly dark. And that was I guess was the first time that I met some opposition from a mother. She was afraid. You know, a lot of fear held our parents at the time because nobody likes change. And everything felt so radical to our parents. And so, no, no, no. I mean, we have to respect the whites. That's how we were taught. The JCS, as the junior chamber of commerce, organization, they annually had this uh, beauty pageant, so you know what you call it. And the contestants were white or very fair-skinned. The Queen Show was held on the Saturday of Carnival, and we first had to parade in costume. You talk about that place where the people are carefully living. It is such a place of fun, loving, spraying, and fetting. It is the land where people don't care if Ash Wednesday fall on Good Friday. Man, they love to struggle in this happy, go lucky way. And it was a huge success on the stage. Um, my dress was gorgeous. It was made by Pat Bishop's mother. It's Blockorama, Fetorama, and just now is Masorama. So the foreigner come for carnival, and he telling himself after he had a ball, Trinidad is nice, Trinidad is a paradise. And then all the girls were taken to the country club after the show to be wined and dined. And then on the carnival Monday, we were paraded around town in open cars. Mr. Foreigner, in La Trinity, the people have a carnival mentality. Trinidad is nice. Trinidad is a paradise. Uh, they would get tour abroad and so on as part of the prizes. Once more, I had to wear the costume and dress at a parade in Miami. <laughs> you were not seeing yourself represented. So therefore, there was a false uh, outlook to the world in terms of the kind of people that was living in Trinidad and Tobago. It is always represented by a white, local white or otherwise queen. They are not serious, very few conscious. So I cannot agree with my own chorus. Trinidad is nice. Trinidad is a paradise. But I hear some people talking about a revolution day. Changes anyway. We have to recognize who major enemy is. The major enemy is not your brother, flesh of your flesh, and blood of your blood. The major enemy is the hunky and his institutions of racism. That's the major enemy. That is the major enemy. In the late 60s, there was already a, an undercurrent uh, of, of black awareness, of black consciousness formulating itself among the generation of people who were in their late teens and early 20s in, in Trinidad and in Port of Spain and in the urban areas and so. The Black Panther movement, for example, in the United States, we were able to read a lot about um, those movements and, and the, the fact that, you know, people were standing up for their rights in these countries. Suddenly out of the blue, the thing has struck like something new. Everybody, young and old, going Afro and telling the world. What is it here then? Black is beautiful. Look at the glass. Black, Black is beautiful. It's the texture of us. Lift your head like me. Your heart to wear your color with dignity. Edward Habib was a young Syrian guy who catered for the young black man 
the young urban black dweller who had money, who worked on the docks or who worked in the oil fields or who worked in government, who wanted to appear fashionable and who wanted to appear gorgeous and desirable and right on top of the form. The notion of, of having an advertising campaign that we would call the movement really came out of the black consciousness or black awareness movement that was taking place in the United States of America in that period. We did a series of ads that headlined Man the Movement. Now, these ads created a bit of a stir because there was a sense of the paramilitary about it. There was the, the sense of the urban guerrilla about it. It had a feeling for the Black Panther movement that was apparent in New York and becoming men menacingly so for a lot of people. The actual spark for it was the um, Canadian, uh, the, the, the rebellion by Canadian university students, some of whom were Trinidadians against discrimination in Canada. It's high time that we get rid of that old slave mentality. It's quite important, simple though it seems. We have achieved what once was thought a dream. We have been imitating in the past. Now we have found our very own at last. No more hot comb to press the hair. No more bleach cream to make us clear. Proudly I say, without pretext, no more inferiority complex. Because we know that black is beautiful. At one point in time, we were told that the university had a green. And um, we had a big celebration, big celebration. We cleared out the computers center. There were a lot of chairs and hug ups and so on. And then we found out that um, they were not going to sign. And that is when, well, we, we um, remain in occupation. And the fires came. And um, we were lucky to have an ax to get through the back door away from that smoke. We were sent to the news of what happened to George Williams. A few days after, we got news that the Governor General of Canada was coming to Trinidad. I found it was very disrespectful to ask us at the university to welcome Michener to the university. And we took a decision that we were going to stop it as a show of solidarity with the students into George Williams. It turned out to be a little more than we had bargained for. Uh, a very large entourage came um, to visit the campus. In the entourage, I, I remember the then Governor General Trinidad Tobago, Sir Solomon Ho Choi, there was the then Prime Minister, Eric Williams, a number of other dignitaries, and Mr. Mishina. When Mr. Mishina arrived at, at the gate, the gate was already locked, and the students told him, that you, you can't come in here. He pleaded with them, because he had gotten out of his car, to plead with them. Um, we noticed that Eric Williams had got into his car and, and drove away, and he left the Canadian Governor General there. Um, to face the students. Governor General Michener had gone out and confronted the demonstrators, reasoning with them and promising that their countrymen would receive a fair measure of Canadian justice. And they requested that I come to Canada, myself and, and Dave Dabo. And that is when the thing really gained in international importance. We went to Canada, I admitted what we did in Trinidad, and I justified it. I said, we couldn't, you couldn't expect that the University of the West Indies right, would welcome and would appreciate the presence of your Governor General when your administration was acting so discriminatory against our citizens here. I said, we have taken a decision that whatever you do to the students here, we'll do to the Canadians in the Caribbean. Tit for tat. When Geddes Granger, now McCandle Dagger, became the president of the campus. 
he made certain very fundamental changes in the way university life was, was operating. And we had very, very powerful outreach programs. I, I myself was involved in one. Um, we used to go to Laventil and teach free of charge um, students who wanted to get their, their O levels. Um, the university had a number of students who were in the engineering faculty, and we would send them out to communities to deal with issues of drainage and so on. So there was a very tight bond between the students and the wider community, a very, very strong bond. So that by the time we launched out in February, right, we had group in almost every part of this country. I joined the University of the West Indies in August 1969, having just, just returned from London University. And um, <clears throat> of course, I started teaching Caribbean history. And among my students were Kafra Kambo and Aigori Omi and um, Daga and, and a number of the, the other persons who subsequently became very active. What they were looking for as, as young people, as young students, were persons from the academy who could talk to people like them and, and others, the brothers and sisters, they said, on the blocks. One of the changes that took place in the society was you had more educated people on the blocks. And they are under the streetlights, in some cases with a dictionary, and with the kind of literature that we were projecting on the platform. So the blocks was no longer just the un educated and the whole environment had changed. I'd, I'd, I'd tell you a reflection of the environment that I, I always remember. On Quarry Street, you had a sign saying, without equal rights, black is dangerous. Right? So that was a common sight you saw in, under the street light. A young men educating themselves. We would explain Caribbean history, explain slavery, explain indentorship, talk about the sugar industry, um, all kinds of things which, which we were told they didn't know about, so that uh, our, our function was to open up their minds. And, and, and that we did, you know, for, for most of the, well, we, could, we should say from September uh, 69 right into um, January, February 1970. And then, of course, things developed very rapidly. I found myself in Woodford Square uh, covering a, a very uh, a wretchedly small meeting at which um, Dave Darbo, who is now called Kafra Kamban, and other people were speaking. And they were giving an account of what had happened in, at Sir George Williams. And they were describing the experiences of the students of whom our 12 were from Trinidad. The trial was not likely to be a fair trial, that they couldn't get any blacks on the jury that uh, the judge was very hostile in treating with them, and they, that they, above all, they were saying that the Caribbean had disowned these people, that the Trinidad and Tobago government had not really sought to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to defend them. I think the problem was that I think the government of the day took the wrong position. The government of the day say, um, well, they have to hold them if they're if they, if they damaging people's property. And, the government of the day should have asked the citizens because we asked for them to come home. Well, send them home. Don't, don't, don't bring nobody up there. Don't treat them bad and all kind of thing. That is why they, they, they pelt in computer through window. And we tell them, send them home. On the 26th of February, 1970, an International Day of Solidarity with the students at Sir George Williams was scheduled. We took a demonstration through Port of Spain.